right, well, welcome everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Eric Loken. Uh, he originally went to the University of Madison, uh, Wisconsin at Madison. Um, he's a big Badger fan. He went to the Rose Bowl at the beginning of the month to watch his team play. So if you have any questions about that, I know he would be happy to talk to you about that. Um, after leaving Wisconsin, he went south and went to the University of Oklahoma where he completed his master's degree and he's currently working on his PhD. And his interests are forecast verification, ensemble design, and most recently using machine learning techniques um, on forecast output. And I think that's what he'll be talking mostly about today. So with that, here's Eric. Thanks, Jamie. And uh, yeah, before I get started, I just want to extend a big thank you to everyone here at the DTC and at at NCAR. It's been a very productive visit for me. Uh, and I'm really excited to uh, share some of the work today. Uh, I want to acknowledge Jamie and then as well as I've uh, worked with uh, Ryan Sobash as well, he's in the room, uh, David John Gagne, uh, John Gotway, I don't see if he's here or not, but he's provided some really useful uh, discussions. And then of course my PhD advisor back at Oklahoma, Adam Clark. Uh, so yeah, so with that I'll, I'll get into it, some of the work that I've done here. Um, it's all driven by one really important fact of life, that ensembles are not perfect. <laughs> and this takes a variety of forms. Uh, you can have spatial displacement errors, so you can have one or more members forecasting convection uh, in a place where it actually didn't occur. Maybe the dry line was, was farther east. Uh, maybe you just had uh, model error so that convective evolution was, was not as it actually was observed. Um, even though ensembles try really hard to account for some of the model error, you can still end up with some suboptimal reliability and over dispersion. So a lot of times you have over forecast bias. We see this for precipitation, but also severe weather. And then if you're forecasting things like severe weather, uh, an additional challenge is that the models can't actually resolve some of the, some of the events that you're forecasting like tornadoes. So all of that is where my work can come in and hopefully make things a little bit better. But for my work, um, I just want to talk about some attempts that, um, some non-machine learning attempts at um, basically post-processing ensemble output. So one thing is that if you don't apply any post-processing, and this is for precipitation prediction, looking at the probability that 24 hour precipitation will exceed one inch. And this is from the HRF V2, so it's eight member ensemble. And uh, the black contour just shows where you actually had observed one inch precipitation. So right off the bat, probabilities are generally pretty good, but you have areas like in, does this work? Like in Southern Tennessee, where you have near one probabilities, but observed precipitation was less than an inch there. So um, and if you look at the, the attributes diagram, you have some over forecasting bias. So one, one way to fix this is just to apply a simple spatial smoother. Uh, if you apply the right amount of spatial smoothing, you can get near perfect reliability. But if you apply too much, then you can get under forecasting bias and you lose the resolution of your forecast. Uh, if for severe weather prediction, what's commonly used, again, we can't forecast individual tornadoes, so we have to use proxies that are correlated with observed severe weather. So things like two to five kilometer UH, uh, low level vertical vorticity, upward vertical motion, and those can do a decent job as well, but again, are perfect. So this is an example of using UH uh, greater than or equal to 120 meters squared per second squared uh, for a tornado proxy. So this is just the raw ensemble probabilities of, this is just the storm scale ensemble of opportunity. So there's seven members here. The, the fraction of members exceeding the 120 meters squared per second squared threshold. And so it's, it's, it's a start, um, but the probabilities don't look very good. Uh, they don't look like they represent the true forecast uncertainty. So again, with techniques like this, a lot of times you can do the same thing. You can apply a, a spatial smoother. Um, same thing for precipitation. You can over smooth and then 
what I think is interesting about this is if you look in northern Illinois, there's one grid point that's apparent if you don't apply any smoothing, but then if you uh, apply the smoothing, that grid point goes away. So you lose some information there. And some of these approaches require extensive calibration. So if you go back to using UH as a proxy for tornadoes or all hazards severe weather, like was done in Sobash and Kane 2017, um, they, they found that the appropriate uh, UH threshold varies by region and season. So this, this figure, they're showing what the bias is if you used a single constant value of UH everywhere. And so, for example, if you look at uh, 1st of July, you would have to use, or you would want to use a higher value of UH over the Great Plains compared to over the, the Southeast US because you'd have, if you just use the same value everywhere, you have uh, high bias over the Great Plains and a low bias over the Southeast. Another, another kind of restriction of some of these current approaches is that they might use limited information. So this is a good paper, um, Berkeley Gallo and co-authors of 2016, where they used UH as a tornado predictor. And so in the, in the top upper left panel, they're looking at the probability of tornadoes using only information from simulated UH. But the, what they found is that actually in the eastern Texas panhandle, the probabilities were higher than what would be expected because the environment wasn't favorable there. So once they added environmental information, so things like LCL and then the ratio of surface base to most unstable CAPE, that actually reduced the probabilities in the, in the eastern Texas panhandle and it gave you a better forecast. Uh, so the takeaway is really if we're, if we're going to forecast things like severe weather, we want to consider both environment and storm attributes and uh, multiple variables might contain unique information that currently um, might not be taken into account if you only use UH. So one solution to all that is to use machine learning and machine learning has some important assumptions because it works on the relationships that are present in a training set that are made up of historical data. So implicitly you're assuming data stationarity that the relationships in the future or what you're predicting is manifest in your training set. And you're also assuming that your training set contains perfect observations, which might not always be the case. For example, we can think of observed storm reports, like if you have a severe wind report in the southeast, it might not actually represent, strictly speaking, the meteorological definition of severe wind, but it is a severe wind report. Uh, so that's implicit in, in the machine learning, whatever algorithm you choose. So with those assumptions, if you have predictors and observations from the past, you can feed those into an algorithm of your choosing. So uh, in this talk, I'm gonna focus on using the random forest, but you can also use a neural network or deep learning approaches. There's a lot of different algorithms that you can use. Uh, once training happens, you have this trained model that you can then use to make predictions on unseen, unseen data in real time. So you have new predictors that get fed through the model and you're left with output predictions. So in my work, that's gonna take the form of probabilities of precipitation exceeding a given threshold or probabilities of severe weather. Um, so I mentioned there's a lot of different machine learning algorithms to choose from and I'm choosing random forests and just want to take a little bit of time to, to say why. Um, random forests, one of, the, one of the biggest attributes of random forests is that they handle biased input, biased input data well. And even if, so even if your ensemble is, has biased data, it tends to give reliable, almost perfectly reliable output if you have enough training data. It's like other machine learning methods, it's not confined to linear relationships uh, between the predictor and the predictand. So I don't know if this is, this is just kind of a cartoon, but um, for example, if, if the relationship between UH and the severe weather probability is nonlinear like this, machine learning algorithms are gonna pick up on that. That's not unique to random forests, but it is um, something that machine learning in general can do. Um, 
one nice thing about random forests specifically, though, is that they generally, compared to other machine learning methods, have fewer hyperparameters to tune, and uh, they tend to be a little bit easier to use. So for a random forest, you might only have to pick the number of trees in the forest and give it a stopping criterion, and you don't have to do too much more than that. If you're designing like a, a deep neural network, uh, you have to look at different architectures and different designs that you don't necessarily have to do in, in random forests. You said hyperparameters. What is a hyperparameter? Yeah, so those are just things that you can tune. So that would be like the number of trees, or that would be like the number, the minimum, like when to stop a, a split, when to stop splitting. I'm, I'm going to talk about that on the next slide too, but yeah, good question. Um, the, other, the other advantage is that they can be trained in parallel, so you can, you can train each tree in parallel, so it makes training faster, and then once you have, once you've completed training, it tends to be really fast to run during real time. And then finally, random forests, based on everything that I've seen, tend to be really skillful. So okay, um, how, does, how does random forest actually work? It's made up of these individual decision trees. Um, so essentially one of these decision trees is going to recursively split your data based on, and it's going to find the best um, variable and threshold on which to generate your splits during training. With the goal is that each branch is going to be as different as possible so that once you do find a stopping criteria, or once your stopping criteria is reached, um, you end up with these useful um, leaf nodes is what they're called so that once you run a testing set to the end of the tree, you can say something based on which leaf node that it falls into. And the algorithm, it's just important to note that the algorithm picks, like for example, uh, the variable and the threshold over which to make the best split. Um, so with a random forest, instead of just one decision tree, you're dealing with a whole, whole bunch of decision trees that's determined by the user. And the, the key thing is that each decision tree is unique. And it's unique because it uses a random subset of training samples. And also at each node in the tree, um, it only considers a subset of your total predictors on which to make the best split. So then during testing time, you can run a testing sample through one of these trees. You end at one of these leaf nodes. And you can get a probability. And that's just the, prob uh, the uh, fraction of samples in that leaf node that are associated with a yes observation. So for my work, that would be yes, the precipitation exceeded a certain threshold, or yes, um, the sample was associated with an observed severe weather report. And then, so you, at testing time, you'll get a probability from each tree. A random forest probability is just the mean probabilities over all the trees in the forest. Um, so. Applying that, that's sort of the general random forest framework. Now I'm going to talk about how it applies to uh, rainfall, which is the first project that I did here at NCAR. Uh, so I looked over the entire CONUS and I compared uh, two different ensembles. So the eight member HREF V2 and then the 26 member SREF, uh, which is a convection parameterizing ensemble. I had a data set of 496 dates from April 2017 to November 2018. And then I looked at predicting different thresholds from a tenth of an inch all the way up to three inches. Um, so in terms of variables, I had a wide range of variables available to me, including um, environmental variables, so temperature, dew point temperature at different levels, cape, sin, precipitable water. And then for the HREF V2, I also had some storm attribute variables like simulated reflectivity and uh, UH as well as forca uh, the forecast 24-hour precipitation. Um, in terms of observations, I just used the NSAP stage 4 precipitation data. Now, all this, these data sources originated on different grids, so I had to remap them to a constant 20-kilometer <coughs> grid, which I did during pre-processing, and that's what this slide is going to talk about. Uh, because when you do some of these machine learning and data science approaches, pre-processing becomes really important and how do you feed the data into the algorithm that you use. Um, so what I did is I tried to reduce the dimensionality of the data set as much as possible. 
I was looking at next day precipitation and severe weather forecasts. So the first thing I did is I had 24 individual one hour forecasts. So I wanted to take the mean, a temporal mean, from each, at each native grid point of each of those files to get rid of the time dependence. The next thing that I did is I remapped the for both the forecast and the, the stage four observations to a constant grid to the 20 kilometer grid. And the reason I did 20 kilometer grid is because we would expect the, uh, the forecast, precipitation forecast to be skillful on about those scales um, at the next day time scales. And it also further reduces the dimensionality of the data set. And then the last, the last step is that I, sample, I randomly sampled 10% of the domain on each day in the data set to, to compile my uh, training data, because if I didn't do that, um, all of the, the there's over 21,000 total grid points in the domain, so it would have been too much. It was just another way to reduce dimensionality. Um, so at the end, my predictors are these ensemble mean, well, time average ensemble mean forecast variables at not only the point of prediction, but also uh, the surrounding, the 24 surrounding points and then for verification, I employed this 16-fold cross-validation technique. Uh, so what this is, is I took my entire data set, I divided it into 16 equal chunks of 31 days apiece, and then say the first chunk was held out for testing, chunks 2 through 16 were used for training, and then once I obtained a trained random forest model, I used that to predict on the testing on all the days in the testing chunk. So ultimately, I got probabilistic forecasts for all the days in, the, in chunk one. I set those aside, and then I iterate. So now I train a new random forest model on chunks three through 16 plus chunk one. And then at the end, I use that new, new random forest model to predict on the days, all the days in chunk two. And I keep doing that until each chunk has had the chance to be the testing chunk. So at the end, I have probabilities from all 496 days in the data set, and I can compute my verification statistics on that. Um, so one couple things that I did, so I looked at rock curves, attributes diagrams, and performance diagrams. So the random forest in each of these figures is in red. The raw, I don't, yeah, you can, there's enough contrast there. The uh, purple forecast represents just the raw ensemble probabilities, <coughs> so just the fraction of members that exceeded, in this case, this is showing the one inch threshold. And then the blue, the blue is what happens if you spatially smooth the raw probabilities so that you get, uh, you essentially optimize the reliability component of the Breyer score over the given training set. So a couple things to note. First, the random forest in red has the best discrimination ability of the three forecasts. It's much more apparent for the SREF um, it also, in both cases, the random forest gives near perfect reliability. And then if we look at the performance diagrams, it's really apparent for the SREF, the random forest is clearly better than either the raw or the smooth ensemble probabilities for this one inch threshold. If we look at for the HREF V2, it's, the random forest is clearly better than the raw ensemble probabilities, but essentially it's right on top of, it's about the same as the smooth ensemble probabilities. And probably that is because already the, the HREF V2 is producing really skillful precipitation forecasts. Um, if we look at Breyer skill score, we see <coughs> similar, similar findings. Um, just look at Breyer skill score. HREF V2 has a little bit of benefit from the random forest, but the SREF has much more benefit. The random forest also gives better reliability. So in this, it's the second panel, lower is better, and then also uh, the random forest gives higher resolution than, than the other forecasts. Uh, in, this, in the third panel, you want it to be higher is better. So just, just to illustrate this, uh, what it looks like on a certain day. Uh, so this was a day where you had a, a cold front passage over the, the upper plains, and let's see, for the, for the SREF, well, off the bat, both the SREF and the HREF 
were quite skillful, just their raw ensemble probabilities without any post-processing. But again, reliability is, is some suboptimal. So with the SREF, if you want perfect reliability, you have to really smooth the forecast a lot uh, so that you introduce a lot of false alarm in the upper, upper Midwest. That once you use the random forest approach, you reduce that false alarm, but you maintain your high sharpness. For the HREF, your probabilities are already really skillful. Um, smoothing does help with reliability, but if you do the random forest, again, you can recover some of the sharpness. So, okay, so this was a, I, I did this work at the very beginning of my visit here, and I was sharing some of the results with, with Adam Clark, my advisor back at OU, and somewhere along our conversation I said, boy, I bet somebody out there could apply this same technique to severe weather, and I bet I had this, this image in my head, and I said, I bet we could, we could get near perfect reliability for, for severe weather forecasts from uh, CAM forecasts. And his response was, well, if you think it's gonna be so good, you know, why don't you do it? <laughs> and so I had, to, I had to do it. I had no choice at that point. Um, but in, in my head, I was not only thinking of the attributes diagram, but I was also thinking, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could make something like uh, day one convective outlook from CAM ensembles so that's what I set up to do in the second half of my visit here. Um, so the goal was compare some of these random forest forecasts with SPC forecasts and then also some UH-based uh, probabilities. So looking over the entire CONUS, the next, still the next day time frame from 12Z to 12Z, this time on the 80 kilometer grid to match what the SPC does, and slightly different data set with 629 dates from April 2015 to July 2017 and this time using the storm scale ensemble of opportunity as the ensemble, since it has a nice uh, long record of archive that I could tap into. And then in terms of the observations using storm reports from the SPC storm events database. So the idea was to make conus wide forecasts for all the individual hazards that the SPC issues, as well as day one convective outlooks. So how I did it, was I had a different random forest predicting each hazard. So for example, I, one did any tornado and then another one did just significant tornadoes and so on. And then for the, to create a categorical outlook, I used the same exact criteria that the SPC uses. Now, one interesting thing is that the SPC, when they have their convective outlooks, they just have discrete contours. So if you're, thinking about forecasting severe wind, they tend to only forecast or, or draw, draw contours at 5%, 15%, uh, 30%, and so on. So I wanted to compare the random forest approach to the SPC, and I did it in two ways. And the first way I did it is just uh, basically truncating the random forest probabilities to match the discrete probabilities that the SPC uses. The other way that I, that I looked at is uh, Chris Carson's back at, at the SPC and the NSSL, actually just was just coming out with this method to convert discrete SPC probabilities to continuous probabilities. So he, this is a screen capture from a presentation that he gave um, back at last year's AMS. And he was kind enough to provide this data set to me. So that's, that's another method of, of comparison that I'm gonna use. In terms of UH forecasts, I wanted to make sure to calibrate it for each hazard. So I chose uh, the UH threshold and the degree of spatial smoothing that optimized the Briar skill score for each hazard that I'm predicting. So for an example, uh, if I'm forecasting any tornado, then I'm gonna use a threshold of 120 meters squared per second squared and a, a standard deviation of the Gaussian kernel of 150 kilometers. But that's gonna be different for wind and hail, and that's gonna be even different for, for significant wind, significant hail. And I also looked at any, the, the probability of any severe, severe weather or any significant severe weather. So the, the UH had to be tuned for each of those specifically. So in terms of the data available, again, I'm working with the SSEO this time. And the drawback of the SSEO 
is that they're, they don't have a lot of variables that they've archived, even though they have a really long record of archive variables to look at. So there's only 10 fields originally available. They are hourly fields, 12Z to 12Z, um, from each, each of the, the ense seven ensemble members. And so there are some storm fields like uh, UH and max hourly, updraft speed, reflectivity, that sort of thing. Um, and there's also some environmental variables, so low level temperature, dew point, relative humidity, shear. So yeah, so these are all originally on the four kilometer grid. So then I also added a few variables because there, there weren't very many to start with. So before I remapped everything to 80 kilometers, uh, one variable that actually showed uh, significant skill was Cape times shear, just a simple multiplication. When I included that, it was a lot, the skill of the random forest uh, went up a lot. And then after remapping to 80 kilometer, I also used, or I also added just latitude and longitude so that the random forest could learn spatial patterns. And then I also used the smooth UH probability since that's, that's essentially what the, uh, just the UH forecasts had as well. And so I figured the random forest might be able to make use of that as well. So I used the same general procedure. I won't go, I won't spend a lot of time on this because I talked about it before. The, the main difference was in this step that I'm taking, for precipitation, I took a temporal mean <coughs> over the 24 hour period. This case, for some variables, I'm gonna still take the temporal mean, but for the convection related variables, I'm gonna take the temporal max. So that's what I'm showing here. Um, after taking the, after getting rid of the time dependence, I remap everything to the 80 kilometer grid. And then the other difference compared to the precipitation forecast is that instead of just using an ensemble mean as predictors, I'm now gonna use ensemble statistics. So ensemble max, min, mean, and standard deviation at each point in the CONUS. And since we're on an 80 kilometer grid, now I don't have to randomly sample a subset of the CONUS on each day. I can use, I can use all, of the, all of the points. And just like before, I'm like the, the predictors for a given point of prediction are gonna consider variables not only from that point of prediction, but also the 24 closest uh, points. Same thing as before, just 17-fold uh, cross-validation now. Exact same method as before. Um, and this is what I found. Um, this is results, Briar skill score over the entire uh, domain and over the entire 629-day period. Ran the red is the continuous random forest. The yellow is the truncated random forest. The light blue is the original discrete SPC probabilities. The dark blue is, is the continuous SPC probabilities. And the gray is, is the UH, which the, the calibrated UH. And the first thing to note is that the red representing the continuous random forest has the highest prior skill score in any category. So that's really interesting. Also, the 95% confidence intervals are plotted in, in the black air bars. Um, I'll just, it might be worth going hazard by hazard. So for any probability of any severe weather, the SPC doesn't actually forecast this. So the best comparison is probably between the random forest and then the, the UH forecast, which is continuous. And so there's a, a huge difference. It's statistically significant. Uh, the random forest does a lot better. Um, one thing I'll say about that real quick is that um, the UH forecast could probably be a little bit better if I would have used a time and space varying threshold, which I did not do. Um, but even so, uh, this, is, this is pretty substantial improvement. Um, scores across the board are less for significant severe weather, um, but even for, for any significant severe prediction, the random forest does better. For tornado prediction, the random forest approaches still do relatively well, but they, they don't statistically perform better than the SPC, although they do perform statistically better than the UH forecasts. And that could be because I didn't really use any tornado specific predictors in this study. Uh, for, again, for the significant hazards, the air bars tend to be larger. Uh, the random forest can struggle with some, some of these uh, significant hazards because they're rarer events. So 
there's not as much opportunity for the random forest to learn. Uh, the random forest really shines for uh, severe wind and also severe hail events. And I'll talk some more about that, get into some other results on, on the slide. So just showing uh, reliability and, and performance diagrams, again, going through the different hazards. So this is for, on the left, any severe weather, and on the right is any significant severe weather. The thing to point out is that random forest is really, all, again, almost perfectly reliable, and it, it, there's a notable improvement over UH if you look at the performance diagrams. For tornado, again, at the, at the lower tornado probabilities, as long as there's enough uh, examples in that probability bin, the random forest has very good reliability. It's only once you start getting into the, to the, uh, the higher probability bins where there's just not enough examples that that's why you're seeing the reliability pretty bad in, in those bins. Uh, in terms of the performance diagrams, the ran the both random forest approaches perform pretty similar to the SPC for uh, some of the probabilities, but then at the higher probabilities, again, the SPC does a lot better. For severe wind, if you look at the performance diagrams, there's a clear outperformance of both random forest approaches compared to both SPC approaches and then compared to the UH forecasts. Uh, another thing I'll just take an opportunity to say with the, with the significant severe, like significant severe wind, uh, one, one really big benefit of the random forest is that unlike the SPC, it's capable of issuing probabilities between zero and 10%. The SPC right now, all they do is issue a hatched area that is the probability of significant severe, severe wind, for example, greater than 10%. And if yes, then we'll hatch it. And if not, then, then it's essentially the same as a 0% forecast. So that right there is an area where I think that this random forest could, could help with forecast recalibration. Um, we see a similar result for severe hail, where the random forest approaches tend to be definitely out in front of both the SPC and the UH. Um, so I'll kind of go fast through this, but I also looked at uh, how the forecasts perform in different, different regions from the west, midwest, and the east. And in most cases, the random forest did, did best. Um, it may, may not have been statistically significant, but at least the, uh, the, Bri the Briar skill score w was, was higher in general. That's not true for west. It really struggled in the west predicting tornadoes. Uh, because, again, it's such a rare event in that region. It did the best for these eastern uh, wind reports, and it also re did really well for Midwestern severe hail and also eastern severe hail. And again, just to expand on the point that I made earlier, with some of these uh, significant severe hazards, you see the, the continuous random forest has much greater Briar skill score and a lot of that is a result of its ability to uh, forecast probabilities between 0 and 10%. Because then once you truncate the random forest, so you look at the yellow, uh, the skill decreases by quite a bit. So it's on par with what the discrete SPC forecast is able to, is able to do. Um, so did the same thing for seasonally. A uh, few things to point out here. First, the air, just in general across all hazards, the air bars tend to be uh, larger in the, in the cold season. Where the random forest really performs well is for wind and hail prediction during the spring and summer. So this is March, April, May, June, July, August. The two random forest forecasts uh, significantly outperform the other forecasts. And then similar with, with severe hail prediction. So. Real quick, I just want to show what these forecasts actually look like on a case study. And this wasn't the highest end day, but it shows it's really good because it shows a lot of key features and key differences between the random forest and the UH and the SPC that uh, we see in other days as well. So I have a little animation of what actually happened. You had this surface cyclone that started in central Iowa that moved to the northeast. You had a, a cold front that produce some, some thunderstorms in the southeast. And then at the end of the period, you also have a developing front 
where you, you had some, some storms in Oklahoma and Texas as well. So that's what happened on this day. Again, it was an SPC slight risk day. And now what I'd like to do is go through each individual uh, hazard and see what the random forest predicted compared to the SPC. Um, one thing, the black contour represents, so, so this is tornadoes, and the black contour represents every 2% significant tornado probability. So one thing to note that generally the same areas are highlighted here by the random forest and the SPC, but the probability magnitudes are a little bit different. And the random forest is highlighting uh, less than 10% chance of significant severe, but greater than zero. So it tops out at 6% right on the Oklahoma-Texas border. And now if I put the tornado reports on, uh, there weren't actually any significant tornadoes on this day. But um, in, the, in the upper Midwest, it, was a, it ended up being a good decision for the random forest to shift the probabilities a little bit farther west to better capture those tornado reports. If you look at the wind reports, they're actually quite a bit different, especially in the southeast, where the random forest is predicting 30% probabilities, and the SPC is predicting, at most, the 5% marginal risk. And then the, SP, or the uh, random forest is also predicting, again, uh, non-zero probabilities for significant severe wind in the southern plains. And so overlaying the reports, uh, first off, there was a significant severe wind report that's like right on the edge of the 2% that the random forest issued. And then you did have numerous severe wind reports in the, in the southeast. If you move on to hail, uh, th this, I think, was really interesting because, in general, again, both the SPC and the Random Forest highlighted the Southern Plains as probably the area of, of most concern. But the big difference is the Random Forest was indicating where you see hatched, that's greater than 10% probabilities of significant severe hail, that the SPC just didn't have the confidence to, to go that high on this day. So they ended up not issuing any hatched area. And then just in, for any severe hail, not necessarily significant. The random forest also tops out. There's a, there's a grid point that tops out at 45%. And so if you overlay the, the probabilities, there, was, there were numerous severe hail reports in the area indicated by the, the random forest. And that whole region where the random forest gave, say, 30% probabilities, you ended up seeing numerous just uh, sub-significant severe hail reports as well. So uh, this could be a really useful product uh, to help forecaster calibration. Uh, in terms of the categorical outlooks, again, they look kind of similar, kind of different. So the biggest differences are in the southeast, where the random forest went enhanced, and the SPC just went marginal. And then again, in the along the border of Texas and Oklahoma, the random forest went enhanced for severe hail when the SPC just went slight at this time. And I should say, the, I'm comparing everything against the, the SPC outlooks that are issued at 6Z. So they're valid from 12Z to 12Z, but they're issued at 6Z. And then this is what it looks like with the reports overload. Um, so if I compare now the random forest to the, to the UH-based probs, so this is looking, the first First row is just looking at the probability of any severe, and then the second row is looking at the probability of significant severe, any, any hazard. Uh, I guess I just want to start with the significant severe. They're very, very similar, which indicates that the random forest is, is mostly basing its forecast on UH for significant severe. Uh, for the all hazards, uh, like sub-significant severe, they're, the UH and RF forecasts are a little bit different, especially in the southeast. So that indicates for some of these southeast severe wind events that the random forest is using variables other than just simple UH to make its predictions there. That's the reports overlaid. So yeah, this is uh, kind of a summary slide as I wrap up. So based on my work for both precipitation and severe weather, what I found is that this approach provides reliable, skillful probabilities uh, that tend to compare well with other methods. What's really neat for severe weather is that you can take an ensemble forecast and you can immediately generate 
uh, some of these categorical outlooks that might be really, really useful to operational forecasters as either a first guess or a last check or for calibration purposes. Um, I could really envision this being something useful for operations. Uh, what I did find is that this approach was more skillful for severe weather and it also was more skillful, if you remember, for the SREF as a convection parameterizing ensemble. And my guess is that's because, uh, well, the convection allowing ensembles are already really skillful for precipitation, but even for severe weather, they don't explicitly predict some of these hazards like tornadoes. So there's more room for machine learning to build uh, for severe weather and for convection parameterizing ensembles. So just briefly what's next. So the goal is to take some of these severe weather forecasts, implement it for the HRF V2, since that's the operational convection allowing ensemble. I wanna test these, uh, this approach in operational or pseudo-operational environments such as HWT. And then the next step on, on the research side too is to look at interpretability metrics. And I've started doing some of this. I didn't get a chance to, to include some of it in, the, in this talk, but uh, looking at things like how sensitive is, is the random forest to, to perturbations in different variables and uh, just looking at a host of interpretability techniques and to see what we can learn from some of these forecasts and why and how they differ from human-based forecasts. Um, so just want to put my contact information up there. Um, I had two papers that had come out of the visit, so I'll throw those up there. The second one is, was just submitted last week. Um, if the review process goes well, maybe it'll be out this, this year. Um, and then the final last thing before I wrap up. So I'm going to be doing a very basic machine learning uh, tutorial. So this is ideal for beginners. If you've never used scikit-learn or, or Keras before, um, then it'd be perfect for you. Um, it's going to be Monday, January 27th from 1 to 4 p.m. in Foothills uh, 3, 2072. Um, if you already know scikit-learn and Keras, then uh, you may not have to show up because you probably know everything and more that I'm going to be talking about. But for those of you who are beginners and want to get started, then it might be good. So, yeah, that's all I got. Thank you very much. All right, so we are recording this, and so if you do have a question, I'll ask that you use the mic so we can make sure to pick that up. So, questions? <laughs> oh, you were just... No, go. Excellent presentation, thank you. Um, looking at um, the performance diagram, I'm actually trying to understand what you have plotted on there. Um, I'm, I'm guessing it's like all the dots are um, the different probabilities. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So but I just want to, maybe you want to run through that with some people. Yeah, exactly. So all the dots represent the different forecast probabilities. So I guess just even a step back, so on the y-axis is probability of detection, and then the x-axis is success ratio. And so as you increase your forecast probability, let me think if I do this on the fly, but I think your uh, probability of detection is going to go down. Um, so as, essentially, as you increase your probability, uh, you go down the you go down the forecast, or you go down the, the performance diagram. So these would be the smaller uh, forecast probabilities. And then these would be your larger forecast probability. So essentially, you're binarizing your forecast at the different probability levels. Yeah. And I think I did like every 10%. That's what you're seeing there. Um, thank you. Yes, very good talk. Um, I'm learning a lot more. Um, I would definitely fit in that beginner uh, category. Um, I'm, I'm curious, and I apologize if I, I, I missed the nuances for this, but what do you see as a pathway to an operational use, you know, by SBC or the forecast offices or, or whatever? I'm just, you know, yeah. is this something a day-to-day -day meteorologist would use, or is this more like SBC and their outlooks and things like that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think definitely the first step is putting it in, in front of forecasters. Um, so first step could be the HWT. I also, um, I'd include, 
did not include it in this talk, but I also, actually I might have the link, I have the precipitation <coughs> forecast running live every day for anybody to use. Oh, oh shoot, do I have it? Um, and the link, that's on the HRF Viewer website created by Brett Roberts. And I think maybe toward the end I had. Yeah. Oh, okay. I have the link there. So that's, that's one step. And I actually, oops. Yeah, so that website, if you go to that website there, under the precipitation tab, mm -hmm. it'll be uh, random forest or RF props that anybody <coughs> can see. Right now I only have it up for the, for the zero Z run. But that's, that's definitely one step. I think we have to, to answer, get back to your question. We have to put these in front of forecasters. And I actually got an email from one operational forecaster a couple months ago. They were curious about this technology and what, what are the benefits <coughs> and drawbacks compared to other post-processing methods and how do I use it? And that is something that I think is going to require training, um, but I think it, this technique holds a lot of promise. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Hey, really nice talk, Eric. Um, have you seen instances where the machine learning is is showing probabilities for, say, severe weather events, but the SSEO either doesn't have storms there, yes. or um, you know the signatures in UH and all the surrogate diagnostics are almost non-existent? Yeah. So. That's also a really good question. I have, what I see most, let's see if I can pull this up. There's a few slides that I have on this. So what I see, where I see this most often is for Southeast wind reports. So uh, UH has relatively low prob, that's actually one that I can show. I think though, I think there's a better example. Yeah, the one that I showed was, was pretty good. Um, pull this up. So the random forest gives like 30% of probabilities and there's, there's almost nothing there for the UH. And similar with the SPC. And what's going on there, I think it's at least partially an artifact. Let's see if I have it. Yeah, what's driving the, the differences there. Um, at least with the SPC, there's a, there's a high amount of estimated wind gusts there, so it may, you may have non, first off, they tend to be, like you said, not produced by supercells, these, these severe wind uh, events. And then second <laughs> off, uh, from the SPC perspective, they may be some, some weaker uh, severe wind reports. You have a lot of estimated gusts in that region that the SPC might even know that they're going to get severe wind reports, uh, but they don't, they're mind, that's what the next slide is, they're mindful of how that's going to impact their convective outlook. So they might not want to issue 45% you know, severe wind reports for those non supercell cases. Um, I've also looked at some interpretability metrics. This was for a different case that I didn't have, but it kind of speaks to your question. I'll see if I can pull it up. Where it was really interesting that, all right, it might not be worth taking the time. This is kind of a, a weird explanation, but I guess I'll just summarize that. It seems in some of the interpretability stuff that I've looked at so far, the random forest is using different predictors to make the predictions for severe wind in the southeast compared to, say, severe wind from supercell-driven events in other parts of the country. So the answer is yes, that it's learning that UH is not always the best predictor for all types of severe weather events. Yeah, thanks. Very nice work, great talk, and um, you know, good way of pulling everything together. So please don't take this as a criticism of, of your work. It's more throwing out to the community that's here. Um, we're so proud of the fact that we're now running ensembles down as low as 40 kilometers. But when we do post-processing, the first thing is we, we do is coarsen. And um, you know, in this case, by a factor of 20. Right. 
And we all know it's because we still do point-wise assessment and on weather events where you have things like phase errors, you end up double counting those phase errors. So when are we as a community going to develop methods or start using existing methods to think more holistically about how to do assessments so we can really leverage the full advances in these high resolution simulations? Yeah, and that's a really good point. Uh, There is one comment that I do wanna make uh, it's also didn't quite make the talk, but um, it's an important. <laughs> First off, I think you're right that there there are we do want there's problems with the point based approach for verification. That's that's certainly true. Um, the only thing that I also want to make the point of is when you do this machine learning approach, um, a lot of people like uh, David John Gagne, they've looked at using object based predictors. And that's certainly a good approach uh, there, uh, but that also has some some drawbacks too. Most importantly, is that it assumes that there's perfect correspondence between observed and simulated storms, which the this point-based approach doesn't do. Now the problem with this point-based approach, there's several. Just like what you said, um, in terms of verification, you might you might have less <laughs> you might have less than optimal verification. Um, but also, it's it's more diff- from a machine learning standpoint, it's more difficult to train. But this, I guess, what I'm trying to say is that there's not really an easy answer for how we how we do this right now. There's problems with both the point-based approach, and there's also problems with uh, the object-based approach. So I don't have any easy answers. Um, yeah, go ahead. So Eric left, but go ahead. I was going to say, Eric gave a seminar along those lines several months ago, you know, talking about ways to do more holistic. But, mm-hmm. And, you know, Tara is trying to work some of that into mode. But yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I guess one minor quibble with, I, I sure. like with, the, with this, the, it doesn't. It does have a radius of influence in terms of right, right, matching right. objects. So there. So it's not like a perfect. It, it can handle some of the the situations where the simulated storms and the observed storms are spatially and temporally sure, sure. distinct from each other. It, sure. There is the limitation where if there is no storm in the model, uh, if you're if you're using an object based approach, uh, it's not going to predict convection there, or it's not yeah. going to predict hail there, or, or whatever right. endpoint. Um, I, I guess uh, kind of go on some of the follow-on broader things. Uh, in your experience, since you're probably working a bit more directly with the SBC than than I have in some of my work, sure. uh, where do you? What are the most common objections to say the forecasters to actually using this or bringing it into in, into their systems? Because I mean, I've been working on this system for a few years, and we're still running into resistance from SBC in terms of actually. Uh, using running it in real time and, and operating it. So, so we're like, have you had some ways to get further uh, inroads or and what, well, what I, barriers are you running into? I'm not sure that I've made that I've made a lot of inroads yet, but um, I have. To, I mean, I have talked with Chris Carson's a lot, and I have talked with some of the forecasters. Uh, one really interesting thing, I guess, that maybe speaks to your point that I kind of touched on, is that. Forecasters have these considerations that machine learning methods and, and maybe some of us as machine learning designers aren't thinking about. Like what I mentioned with the severe wind reports in, in the southeast, where they might they're not they're not SPC forecasters aren't just forecasting severe the occurrence of severe weather reports. They they place a higher emphasis on the stronger high impact tornado and wind events. So in some sense, they may not care as much about um, some of the uh, non-supercell, you know, barely severe wind events. So what that translates to is that when they're drawing, when they're making their forecasts, maybe even though they know that there's gonna be a 60% chance that they're gonna get reports in a certain location, maybe they're not gonna issue that because that would, that would uh, you know, trigger a, an enhanced risk or a, or a moderate risk 
where they, they don't want that. Um, so I think one of the things that is maybe an issue is that, and actually that I think this could help with, is separating, separating the, how do I want to say this? Separating the intensity from the probability, where you're able to get probabilistic, like perfectly reliable probabilistic predictions of each individual hazard, and then working from there to create an outlook versus almost as like the forecasters might be working backwards. Like if I issue such and such probability, maybe it's going to trigger a high risk or something that I don't want to do. So I don't want to speak too much for the forecasters, uh, but yeah, I think there are there are some of these additional considerations that they're having in their mind that maybe we as, as uh, developers of this aren't considering. And so I think the biggest, so how do we overcome that? I think the biggest thing is we want to work with them and get this into a, a pseudo operational environment and talk, uh, have, some, have some training with them so that they know what these products are and how they can be best used. And then hopefully if they're really skillful, then hopefully over time the forecasters will come to accept that as uh, useful guidance, but yeah, that's about, that's about it. Thank you. Any other last minute questions? All right, so Eric is here through the end of the month, though he will be at AMS next week, so don't look for him next week. But if you'd like to chat after that, um, please catch him before the end of January. All right, thanks, Eric. Thank you.